action hey guys welcome to the keeping it 99 podcast with your with your host me and Mona. we have a special guest today uh mr bashoy who's a med student at emory thanks for having me guys it's a pleasure that's a, it's, no, it's a pleasure to have you on no i've been a fan i've been a fan of the show for at least three weeks three Ooh, weeks at least <laughs> that's a that's a big step um well we appreciate your support and we appreciate the support of everyone that's watching it um, but today we're going to be talking about something that's uh, very recent in your memory. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. What are you going to be asking me about? Yeah. Uh, so you just came back from Kenya. I don't know if you remember that. I do. I vaguely remember that. It was yeah. A great trip. So uh, obviously you went on a mission trip to Kenya. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you start with just like. How was it? How was it? Well, it was a lot of what I expected, but also a lot of. Une- I mean, it's half predictable and half like things that you didn't expect to see but are glad you saw the whole idea was that it it actually wasn't a mission trip so i went uh to my school and i said listen global medicine is something that i've wanted to do for a while so what can i do to like during my like last year of med school to make sure that i get as much of that global mission as i can and they said well we have a professor who's in kenya who can mentor you if you want to do something in terms of global research and things like that. So I reached out to her uh, and turns out she has a grant and whatnot for a project on blood transfusions and who's not getting blood and whatnot. The whole point of the details was she said, I have a project to come through. I got my flights and everything booked and I was on my way and I was looking it up. It so happened that there's a Coptic mission in Nairobi. And at the time I thought I was going to be in Nairobi. It wasn't until after I got there that they tell me actually you're going to be like in the mountains, like out, like in the rural wilderness of Kenya, which is really cool. It was a city called Kajabe. Um, so a lot of unexpected, like twists and turns of, you know, where am I going to be living? What am I going to be doing? Who am I going to be working with? Um, and I think one of the coolest parts of the whole trip was getting to, um, I think getting to the Coptic mission and kind of finding my way back to the Coptic church, even though I had no idea that there was even a church there to begin with, but I got to know all the people, got to see the hospital. Um, It it turns out, and I learned a ton about what the medical mission side of things looks like and what like research abroad looks like, but also the Coptic side of things and, and just orthodoxy in general and mission work in general. There's a lot of things that I think I picked up that I wasn't expecting. And so, you know, you find that like God has plans and, and sometimes it works out in ways that you don't expect. Yeah. So obviously a medical mission is different. But when I went to uh, sorry to Zambia, um, we went with the intent that we were just going to do like, you know, normal mission work, like Coptic mission work. And actually what ended up happening is that there was an organization. I forgot exactly what it's called, but it's um, some Coptic medical organization that actually had a mission in Zambia at the same time as us. So we actually ended up working with them and we were like, you know, like they had like actual doctors, like go through like all these like patients. And I was in the uh, pharmacy department (laughs) separating pills and stuff like that. Like we did medicine work. So I I get like exactly like, um, like that, like marriage type of thing you're talking about between like the two sides of it. So, so you, you kind of had it flipped. So you went thinking you were going to be doing more like exactly, yeah. preach the Bible mission work and you ended up in it, like learning a little bit more about medicine and yeah. kind of how that side of work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's exactly what happened. So I guess we got, we got both sides of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, but what is like one thing that you learned about yourself when oh, you were in Kenya? Yeah, this is a big one. I think, the first couple of days there, I was expecting, you know, like I've been to Egypt. I've like done a little bit of traveling here and there that I, I'm expecting to be like not like I'm expecting to be further away from like my regular comfortable environments. I, I was expecting, you know, I'm going to be away from Wi-Fi in a while. and I'm going to be, you know, away from my bed, away from like friends. And so you're expecting a lack of luxuries that you're used to, but it's not until I think I was like two or three weeks in and like mosquitoes were like biting me all over in the middle of the night and like there's no AC and it was hot and my shower electrocuted me while I was trying to change the setting and like things were happening when I was realizing like 
I've gone soft. I feel like there are so many little first world luxuries that I feel like I've gotten used to. And even as much as I tell myself like, oh, I'm grateful for this or thank God for that. Or, you know, like, I feel like I could survive if I needed to. Like, I appreciate things in life. Like, I feel like I'm a pretty thankful person. And then you go out and you experience, like, not just, like, a vacation a day or two, but, like, you're two weeks into a trip and you realize, I still have another six left. Like, I'm going to be here, like, I'm going to be here for a good while. And it wasn't until, like, six, like, like, two or three weeks into this trip where you really start to think, like, wow, I've gone soft. I've taken for granted so many uh, little conveniences in my life. And I feel like it roots me in like a sense of almost like, I, I was almost sad in a sense that like I was so used to having all these little things and I thought I was like tougher built than I was. Like I thought I could be so like so far away from technology and, and outlast the wilderness and all these things. But you realize how grateful you are for these luxuries when you like go out like and have to like live a good chunk of time without it. And not that like six weeks is incredibly long or eight weeks is incredibly long. Uh, there are people who do missions for seven years. There are people I met there who have been there for 20 years, who grew up, went through schooling, had a family, and decided that the calling was Kenya. And so they went and lived in Kenya and they've been there for 20 years and never looked back. I mean, I'm gonna agree with you on like the little luxuries thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I was there for two weeks. I was in Zambia for two weeks, like 14 days exactly. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> when I got home, man, like the like my bathroom at home, like I think I spent just 30 minutes just like sitting in there, like wow, like yeah. you don't you don't. Like, I, I know it sounds the smallest silly. things, yeah. I missed my bathroom, like I missed yeah. my shower. I missed like having a desk I could sit at that like wasn't falling apart. There were so many things that I missed. I missed hot water, a hot shower. Yeah. Um, and then back to like the, you know, people who just spend so long there. I mean, we had Abu Abraham on the podcast last week who spent 14 years in Zambia mm -hmm. um, living a life that I did for two weeks. And I, I, I don't know how, like, <laughs> I don't know how he did it for 14 years. I will say it was, it was kind of peaks and valleys when you first get there, there's the excitement of I'm out in Africa. I can't believe I'm here. Like, and you're kind of riding this high of, you know, I'm actually out here. So the small like inconveniences or like the lack of this is like part of the novelty of it. Part of like the excitement, like, wow, I'm really far away from my world back home. And then when that starts to like fade, you go like into like week one, week two, like if you're a social media person, which I'm not like, and you like all the like you've done all your posting, everyone kind of knows you're in Kenya or you're kind of wherever, that novelty starts to fade and now you start to realize your reality. And then there's like a trough of however many weeks it takes for you to get acclimated to your new life or like the instinct to like pull out your phone and like scroll through Instagram, for example, isn't there because there's no internet or like the, the expectation that when you go into the shower, you're like waiting for hot water to start picking up. Yeah. Like once that starts to go away and, and they say it takes about like 21 days to break a habit or start a habit. I think after that period, you start to get used to it again. And by the end of this, like the month to like six weeks, I was kind of back on the rise of this is like becoming life again. Uh, and then you start to like, I think, build a, a better tolerance. Um, but I think it, it was the same for a lot of things like that happened with med school, like the novelty of med school. And then the trough of like the work and like the overload of knowledge and all this stuff that you got to learn. And then once you start getting into the rhythm and the routine, you start picking it back up again. You start to appreciate the little things a little bit more. And then your happiness starts to pick back up. Yeah. I mean, what exactly did you get out of those two months in Kenya? Like, did you have a different feeling when you came back or like, what, what was the end? That's a good question. What did I take out of it? I feel like the one thing that. And, and this is probably true, and and if any words like cliche for anyone who does any Michigan work, you could probably say the same. But just like gratefulness, or like the idea that you'll never look at something like a like a small th like you'll never look at a little luxury again the same. Like every little thing, and and this effect could wear off. Like I, I just came back about a week ago, mm -hmm. but I know like it feels like I'll never forget how 
like amazing going to a Starbucks and just getting a coffee is, or I'll never like take for granted this idea that like I have like a car to go places and a house with like family in it or like a, a bathroom and a shower yeah. and a toilet that you know how to operate. Or like the, the, <laughs> the toilet that's not part of the shower. Like it's mm -hmm. not, it's not like, yeah. And not even just about your own life, but how many people did you see who are incredibly happy in their own right, oh who you God. would look at and you think, wow, like I, there's no reason I couldn't have been born into this person's shoes. There's no reason like I like deserve the luxury that I have to like go to school for free and have a family that supports me and have friends that, you know, aren't pushing me to do drugs or join crime or sell my body or do all these crazy things. Like there's so many like things in other people's lives that I think I started to realize like, I don't know, a little bit more about like the, the I guess the blessings that God put in my life a yeah. little bit. I mean, I'll agree. And then I'll say like my response to that question that Mona just asked would be like just the joy, which like ties back exactly what you were just saying. Like those people just seeing them like in the state they are. And it's like, I, I mean, I said on the last two podcasts actually about the, the, the sticker story where it's like, oh, yeah. it doesn't matter what, they have what they get it's just they're just so content and they're so happy with what they have that like it doesn't matter what life throws at them and i feel like that's something that here in america that like we just we don't have we're always trying to look for the next thing the next thing the next thing um that's like the idea of the western world that's capitalism in itself like and it's that's not saying there's something wrong with it or that it needs to be changed but it's like we have to be able to take a step back and we have to be able to be like what is the real purpose of all this? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's funny that you bring up this idea of the Western world. There were so many things, I think, throughout the six weeks that I started to learn about when it came to like people or when it came to certain cultural perspectives. Like, for instance, the reason why like people here and for good reason, I think there's benefits to both uh, perspectives, but people here are always looking at what could be always looking for improvement. There's a sense of stress on like autonomy and creating your way like here for example you would think people living in western society are like like perfectly happy and like yeah like the government has like certain things or you know my life like could be a certain way but people are always looking for more and and i think like more in eastern culture and this was true in eastern africa and in kenya when something bad happened in the government like i talked with a lot of taxi drivers or people worked in the hospitals it was kind of like a, uh, this is out of our hands this is just how things are. There's no sense of I can change this or I wish this was something different. Like people are just like, yeah, there's there's poverty and the government is corrupt, but this is just how life has to be. This is just how life is. Whereas here, even though you would think because things are better, quote unquote, than it is in Kenya, maybe there might be less like, like overt corruption. Maybe there's less like extreme poverty in the US. You would think people are like, happier but no people here are always gunning for the the next thing like one thing in policy is like maybe not ideal they're always pushing for the next best thing or always pushing for more and i think you can merge the two perspectives into something that's a little bit healthier in a way where there's a sense of appreciation but also a sense of striving for the best i think here we lack a lot of appreciation. I think Western world, if you talk to a lot of people, even Americans or people who were born in Europe, et cetera, you might get the sense that they don't, they don't appreciate where they come from or there's no love for where they grew up or the blessings in their life. It's a lot of focus on the negative, which if you flip it into a way of, I appreciate what's going on and I appreciate what I have, but I know it could be better, is I think a healthier perspective. Contrast in Kenya, there is no striving. Things actually moved really slow. I could tell you a lot of funny stories about being in the operating room in Kenya and, and just like the, and, and how like things moved or how like perspectives are when it came to work or like there's no sense of urgency. But that stems, I think, from a, a place of content, which to an extreme could be a bad thing. In, in in Kenya, things are very relaxed. I don't know how it was in Zambia. Yeah, like know, things don't relaxed. move. Things are very relaxed. They don't start their like work day till like 10 a.m. There's no sense of getting something done urgently. 
but that's also kind of what bites them in the uh, in the rear end i guess whenever they're trying to you know fight for something better there's not really a whole big movement on improving the system because there's a sense of like hopelessness or a sense of this is just how things are we're just going to keep moving with it so they appreciate where they are they don't look and say i wish i had this or the sense of jealousy or a sense of um lack of appreciation none of that like you get you feel like even the poorest to the richest they're all very content with their life but there's no striving for better and so not that you asked but i feel like if you were going to merge the two perspectives you'd you'd land somewhere in the middle maybe something more uh christ-like i guess yeah no i like that response a lot and like something that that i think like to like challenge like um sounds like the viewers and challenge us as well is like always have this mentality of like like what you just said like appreciate what we have be like yes like this is great everything we have but strive for better like a perfect example of this is like um at least for us for me and one does this podcast like i don't think we've ever put out a video being like man that was i mean tell, tell me if i'm wrong but like where we've been like wow like that was terrible oh no like we won't just uh, we won't upload it yeah we <laughs> have you ever had a podcast where you said that was perfect nothing yeah. could have been better no. i mean yeah perfect <laughs> i mean not maybe perfect, on his side <laughs> but i mean really good but yes we've had really good ones yeah. but i think the part of the reason why I, like i mean this is by the way the 20th episode mm -hmm. just want to put that out there so congratulations you're on the 20th episode thank you it's, it's um <laughs> but i think the reason like how we've been able to go this long is a lot of people did not think we're going to make it this long, but don't worry. We're, we're, we're still keeping here. Keeping the dream alive. Keeping it alive. Is that there's always a sense of it can be better. Mm -hmm. It can be better. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at any successful business model, any su su sorry, successful person or organization, anything, there's always this sense of better, better, better. And once they feel like they've reached the peak, that's where they, the, the decline starts. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, um, he, 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 like even here in America, there's there's groups of people and like people in general that just believe that they believe that idea that, you know, things have like what else is there, you know, and it's those people and those, you know, belief systems that kind of like fade out and like like that's that's what um, keeps like the sorry, the popular like opinion, like changing all the time, because if it's not changing and it goes stagnant, like in America, there's nothing for that. It's a double-edged sword though, right? This idea of you can never reach the peak. It pushes you, but it could be flipped into greed very easily. Yeah. Um, and selfishness. And selfishness. Yeah. I mean, what is your purpose for striving? Because I know that, you know, working with the church there, they were always building a new church or they were always adding a service. Or they're always building something, but no one's sitting there like thinking, I'm going to take the glory for this. There, there's, yeah. It, it's okay to strive, but if your goal of striving is for yourself and yourself only, it'll leave you feeling empty because you're as much as you can please yourself. You're one person. Mm -hmm. If you feel like you're working towards pleasing hundreds of thousands or something beyond you, your happiness limit is beyond what you can contain. It's, it's now multiplied by however many people you're trying to affect or, or the goal that you're trying to work towards, which, which is to say that, working towards the peak if your goal if yourself is the only goal you'll be limited to your own happiness but if you're working to the happiness of others then you're multiplying your potential for like for joy essentially i mean yeah that's that's 100 percent true and like and i feel like in africa there's this sense of family right like there's this sense of it's a community no one there's no individualism or there's like very limited and so that adds that idea of, you know, like what they're doing, why they're doing it. It's not for themselves. It's for the people around them. And you can take that a step further and be like, instead of doing things for humanity and self, do things for the glory of God, because God is endless, like infinite. And so that, that joy, that happiness that spreads, that it, it does not end. There's no limit to it. And I feel like um, that's something that a lot of people in the Western world struggle with is this double mind, not just the Western world in general, this double minded life, this here's my life at church. Here's my life at home. Here's my life at school. Here's my life. And I know I struggle with that a lot, like a lot, a lot. And 
it's it's not until you put the effort into combining all those like that's when you realize like life is so much more i'm glad you made that connection to to the infinite like god perspective yeah. like it's not it's working to something bigger i was kind of hinting at it and you jumped to it so that's good yeah i know i i think that uh, I think there was a lot of lessons to take out of that. Basically, I know this is just all a long-winded answer to your question of what did you take out of Kenya, yeah. but I think there was a lot of perspective change. I think I got to see a lot of like tangible experiences. I think I got a lot to see, you know, how the model of service works, how the model of spreading Christianity works, how the model of uh, like opening a hospital and getting people involved and meeting new people and merging ideas and different cultures together all that you get to see while you're there which is really interesting so that's what i took out of it i mean there's just so there's yeah. so much in it that like i mean we could be here for days and we wouldn't stop yeah. talking about it yeah how it's much something time you, you like <laughs> how long <laughs> is this podcast allowed to go <laughs> it's it's literally just you have to experience it like you have to experience it yeah um Dude, I, I have no say in it because i've never been to kenya nor zambia so I mean, I mean, you did, so, I mean, yeah, you did go, actually, so, for sure, I don't know if you knew this, but, um, was it last week? Yeah, last, last week. Last week, uh, we went to the convent. the convent, and we did a little, like, in Georgia mission trip to Clarkston. Oh, yeah, I've been to Clarkston. Yeah, it's yeah. like yeah. tons of refugees, and. It was great. It was great. So, Mon, I'm going to ask you, because mm. I asked you this in the last podcast, I'm going to ask you again, what did you, like, name one thing you took away from that Clarkson trip? Like what is like the main takeaway you got from that, that type of mission? I know it's a local mission, mm. but like what did you get out of it? I mean, dude, everyone is together. Like it's all friendship. It's it's all friendship and they're all. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> the Clarkston mission is awesome. I went through school and there's a lot. It, it, you know, it's the most diverse square mile in America. Yeah, yeah. 180 mm -hmm. family or uh, people groups. People groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think just uh, the friendship, it, it was amazing. Like everyone came together and people from like another block just went in others' houses as if they were like family. Yeah. And we all came together on the last day and had like a soccer tournament. So that that was really great. And just seeing everyone happy, it was, it was, it was good. Yeah, I mean, like even in... America. And this is this is the part that really gets me is and that it's so close to us. Exactly. And we don't it's realize it. Like Clarkson, Georgia is eleven miles yeah. from where St. Mark prays, which is in Sandy Springs. So if you live in Marietta, Clarkson is about an hour and a half drive. Yeah. You know, you live in like it, it's from where most people that watch this podcast live, it's about an hour and a half away from you. And it, it just tells you like you don't have to go to Kenya exactly. to yeah. interact with people who have a different mindset than you like this idea of it have you heard the saying it takes a village mm -hmm. it takes a village to raise a child right i've so, never heard of it but. so it's a it's a saying on it's not just like one family or one person that raises a child like a person growing up in society is influenced or cared for by everyone they interact with mm -hmm. and that's especially true like in places like clarkston or places like egypt or kenya or wherever you go where it doesn't feel like you're being raised by a singular person or like by a family. It feels like you're interacting with everyone around you as you grow up. And that whole perspective is 11 miles away. You don't need to be going to Kenya. You don't need to be going somewhere else to get a perspective or somewhere else to serve. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, you were saying like, it's important that everyone should experience this idea. It doesn't mean flying across the world. Though that is you helpful. Go 10 miles. I you mean, go 11 miles away and yeah. find a bunch of people who don't look like you, who don't talk like you, and who might not share any of the same beliefs with you, but you'll learn a lot by serving them or seeing what kind of life people, not where you grow up, like it, it, basically people who aren't you live like. Yeah. And I mean, Christ said this when he sent the apostles, he said, go to Judea, uh, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, which like if there's an interpretation of it where it's like to your own house, to your little group, and then to your community. And like 11 miles is considered your community in this yeah. day and age. Like that's, that's like right next door. So, I mean, you, I mean, like, uh, like, sorry. Um, I mean, like the service starts like in your own homes. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Like, and that's like something that I challenge myself and I challenge everyone that listens to this, like start the service in your home, start the service with your friends and then go to the community because like there are so many ways to serve. That's not just, you know, but how do you serve in your home? Like one example. How do you serve your home? Bishoy, do you want to answer that for us? If you have any idea, like if you. That's a good question. I was actually going to ask you guys what you think, like two things that like service could do or like what, like is the, what is the purpose of service? But how do you serve tangibly in your home? Service in general, I think the way it looks is not always I, I go somewhere and I like build a home or I plant a farm or I donate money or I teach or any of that. Service could be, like could really be simple. Ser- service could be as much as like changing yourself and your perspective and the way you act so that others around you are influenced. Mm. And I think the home is the most likely scenario for that. If you're a sibling, the way you treat your siblings, if you're a son or a daughter, the way you interact with your parents. And then probably the most influential is when you're a parent, how do you model for your kids to grow up? But to say that it's only parent to kid, I don't think it encompasses everything. I assume you're talking home as in your immediate family. Yes, yes. But even amongst like home, like your home church or home, like your home school or your home class or whatever it may be, it's all the same. I think it's how you model yourself and making sure that when you interact with people, you're spreading the, the service being how Christ lives. I think there, there's few little, I think there's few ways that are better than modeling these things yourselves and, and making sure that others around you see that there's a difference between the person who calls himself a Christian and the person who doesn't. And, that's not to say that they also can't be good people, but there's a reason that your good and your influence comes from this title that you hold and it should be apparent. But if you hold the title and don't serve in that way, don't act a certain way or influence people a certain way, then you're almost disservicing. You're disservicing your title. I mean, I agree. And I would like, go even further to say that service in the home can be so simple. It can be, you know, doing the dishes for your, when you're like without your parents asking, it can be just like doing something for your siblings. Like service is service. Like what service is service is like humility. It's like putting yourself, putting your needs below the needs of others, like putting others before you. And so I feel like service in the home is, is very, very simple. And a lot of times we overlook it. But it's almost the most important service because if you can't influence the people that you spend the most time with, how are you going to influence the people that, you know, you go to a mission for? You might only see for a day when you're going to teach exactly, such yeah. and such Sunday school or whenever you're going to visit someone for a week in Zambia. That's a good point. And I think the behavior that you model in the home or outside the home is a reflection of your character. A person who would call themselves you know, sacrificial and humble is someone who would do the dishes without being asked or is someone who would help out their mom whenever they at like or whatever it may be. Uh, it's not necessarily that the like the service. I think the service it's coming from the character or the service comes from the, the heart kind of it's like the actions are a reflection of what your service is. Yeah, it's like, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the tongue speaks, I think is what the saying is. Yeah, if I got is. that right. Sorry. Um, Can we get our uh, producer to look up that verse? It's like something about like out of the out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, yeah. I think is what it is. But I mean, what if what if you're doing all that stuff, like helping around the house, like doing chores, not like to be selfless, but for others to look at you different. Like you're amazing. Like, okay. Yeah. So what would you say to that? So I have a, this is like a personal opinion. So, um, and I'll tie this back to the church just cause it's easier in that sense. And I'll tie it back to Kenya in a second. Cause okay. there are people who do mission work who aren't doing it for the, the but love the of the service help, yeah. or the mission, but it looks cool when you go abroad mm-hmm. and do something. So, Definitely. um, so like in the church sense, right. You have a lot of people who, you know, like, for example, like show off, like, you know, during Tisbaha, like they know like their stuff, you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 
So there's a lot of people who would say like they thanks for showing. There's a lot of people there's a lot of people who would say like, oh, those people like shouldn't go to church or even sometimes those people don't feel worthy enough to go to church. But I believe that in order to to start because that's acting like Christ is doing stuff not for yourself. So in you got the verse? Yeah. What what where like where is it in though? Give us the reference, yeah. Just what's the reference? All right, Luke six forty five. That was the verse about the, the mouth and the heart. Got it. Okay, so back to my point. Um, uh, yeah, like so in church, like there's people that like show off and all that, and sometimes those people don't feel worthy enough to go to church, or even like in general, like a lot of people don't feel worthy for whatever reasons. But the the thing is that whatever you surround yourself with, like whatever goes in the brain, is what's coming out the brain. So, like, exactly what that verse says, out of the abundance of the heart, you know, the, the mouth speaks. So, like, you always have to keep going, keep giving, keep doing, keep, like, do these habitual things, even if they feel like a checklist or feel, it feels like you're just checking boxes. Keep doing it because the Spirit will, will happen. And, like, for example, His Grace was at St. Mark's today and gave a very good sermon. And one of the things he said is that, you know, loving has two levels. There's the love of the mind and then the love of the heart. Mm. So first you have to make the decision, which is what, these are his words. You have to make the decision to love, make the decision to give, make the decision to do all these acts and to give and to do all these things. Make that decision and God will transform that checklist into a feeling. It'll, it'll transform that. Even if you don't feel like doing it, it'll transform it into pure love. And so it's that same thing like, like keep Keep going at it, even if you feel like you're doing it for yourself. Keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And try at the same time to shift your mindset, and God will do the rest of the work, and your mindset will be shifted. I want to piggyback off of that, because I was talking to a lot of the doctors that moved to Kajabe, like mm -hmm. the, the rural hospital. It started off like over 100 years ago with like a small clinic, and it was a school for missionaries, and then it developed into this big hospital. But a lot of the doctors that live there now have been there for seven, 10 years, 15 years. And a lot of them have uprooted their whole lives to move there. And so some might ask, you know, what if they're doing it for themselves or what if they're doing it for the appearance? And even if you ignore the fact that there's a lot of financial sacrifices and from like relationship sacrifices that people make to go there, you could argue that some people might do it for the appearance or some people are doing it, but it might not be coming from the heart. The idea that you'd made the decision to go if you continue working on it, then God does, t it, the impact of your work sometimes is based on things outside of your capabilities, right? Yeah. We do our best and God takes the rest. Some people's mission can be blessed by God. So you made the decision to go and your heart and God blesses whatever comes next. For some people, their mission will still go out and do wonderful things. And for some people, they'll like there are people that there are many people who do mission work or who might do any kind of service for the wrong reason. And when they start that service, it might be easy at the beginning, but sustainability, if their heart isn't in it, it might not flourish the way they might like, or it might, they might not be able to continue in it the way they, they want hmm. someone who wants to, let's say do medicine or do any kind of schooling for the wrong reasons and starts do you think that when the trials and tribulations and the struggles and obstacles and, and all those things, like the doubts start to come later on, if their heart hasn't followed, if their true desire to serve hasn't followed, it won't be sustainable for them to continue pursuing this thing. And the opposite might be true. Some person might start for the wrong reason, but because their continued trial and effort, their heart follows and then they're able to continue it. And so I really like the idea of the mind starts it and then the heart continues and, and God blesses whatever, whatever you continue in. And I'll agree with that second example as a personal thing for me. Like, um, like there was a time, like you guys made the joke about this, about that, that was like a real time in my life where I went just cause to look cool, to show off whatever. Mm. But just because of my continue, like, I go every week for, I've gone every week for, I don't know, five, six years. At this point, like maybe a couple years ago, my, that mindset shifted and it really changed into me. 
I'm not doing it for myself anymore, but I'm doing it because of God. Like I really am doing it because, you know, like the service, like I need, I need to go to this behalf for myself. And, th and that's the more sustainable way to do exactly. it. Exactly. Right? Because if you were still doing it for yourself, then as soon as yourself becomes no longer into it, then whatever you were working on stop there. But if your motivation and intention is rooted in something more stable than just your own desires, like God or service or others, then it's going to be easier to continue even when your own desire isn't in it anymore. Like mm -hmm. if your own benefit stops, but because you're doing this thing for something beyond yourself, it's going to be easy to continue this service in church, whatever it may be. I agree. And I think that's the tying it all back to the Kenya thing. That's why a lot of people that are there, even though they go through the struggles and they, I'm sure they go through the hardships of having their whole family uprooted to move and do this mission work. I can't tell you how many families like you run into who have given up this sacrifice of wanting to do the Lord's work. And the reason why they're successful and sustainable is not because it's something they want to do. It might start that way, but because it's rooted in something God wants them to do or something that they know helps others and they see the work that they do have impact, even if it wasn't up to them, even if it was up to them, they, like, and they didn't want to continue it as much, maybe they're having a harder day, they'll still show up to work and they'll still continue in their mission because it's rooted in something more f structurally sound than your own whimsical, like personal desires. And I think that ties it back to what we were saying earlier about centering your life around God. Like seek first the kingdom of God, like God, like he meant that when he said that, like it, it was real. When you seek first the kingdom of God, everything makes so much more sense. And I've noticed this like in my own life, like, when I really put aside like all the trivial stuff of this world, when I like stop focusing on the wrong things, I notice that those things that I used to focus on come like grades, like grades, for example, when all you do is focus on school and you don't, you know, pray before you study or like simple things like that. If you don't do that, like studying is like hard. It's not easy. But when you start doing those things and getting out of your comfort zone and really seeking God first, through your studies, it just, it, things make, things fall into place a lot easier for you. And I, I don't know, but sure if you can attest to this, but like, it's, it, God does his work. He's not chilling. Like he does. He does. And I feel like, I, I want to hear your guys' perspective on this too. But when you feel like you're working to something that's not yourself, don't you feel like a little bit more F, like reason to keep going through it? Like what's an example of that? Do you have an example? Not really. I mean, you could start and then I'll see. Okay, so um, I'm going to use the podcast as an okay. example. Uh, at least, like, from my side, like, I remember when me and Wanda started this. Because um, obviously, like, in order to have something successful, you have goals. And mm -hmm. so people, my parents were always asking me, like, what's your goal of this? Like, why, do you, why are you doing this? Why are you wasting hours upon hours of your life doing this? And for me, like one of my main reasons was, you know, the way how God and the church has affected my life in such a positive way, it would be a disservice to all the people around me that maybe don't know Christ in the same way, even people within the church, that I don't share it. If I don't share it, I'm not doing my job. And so for me, that's kind of been like the driving force for this. And I think that's like back to that point, like it's so much more than me. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Yeah, that's in John somewhere. Yeah, can we get it's, our producer uh, to look that up? I think it might be thir third third watch midnight hour. I could bet you. It's chapter six it? somewhere. Yeah, like let your loins be girded and your lamps burning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in that. The one. idea is, whenever you it, this that's true for school. That's true for the podcast. That's true for working out. If your goals are something that are noble and beneficial and something that are desirable then it's going to be easy when the, when the going gets tough to get through it, whether that's for studying for an exam. If you're telling yourself, I'm going to study and I'm going to do this career because I want to make a lot of money or I want to like, I just want to like look cool, then it's going to be really easy. And I, I'm not saying that like everyone who does like this isn't successful, but it'll be a lot harder, I think, to push yourself through the obstacles this was true for Kenya too. Mm -hmm. 
to push yourself through the struggles and the obstacles and the harder times whenever your goals are, are weak and on sand, right? Like if I was telling myself I want to go to Kenya because I, I, I want to look cool in front of, you know, my doctors when I come home and tell them, oh, I went to Kenya to do research. Or if I'm telling them that, like, if I'm telling myself, like, oh, I want to go to Kenya because I, I, I want to, I don't know, be able to post on social media and look cool in front of my friends and say that I traveled, et cetera. Then when the going gets tough and I had, like, you know, days where I was away from internet and I was away from whatever it is, then those were the days where even with, like, a, a decent enough goal, like, and I'm not saying that I'm the most noble person, like, I obviously having the the perspective and the reputation was a, a part of my like reason to go but it would have been a lot harder i think to get through some of those rougher days if i didn't also see that you know the mission out there has a really good impact and the people that you're helping out there or that other people who are more capable were helping out there it's really it, it helps buoys up your your morale whenever you're really struggling on those days. Yeah, but I mean, what if you're forced to do something like that? You think you'll have the same outcome? Like what? Give me an example. I mean, if, you, if you're forced to do, uh, let's say, a certain major in college, you think you'll come out with a degree or you'll quit later on? Because that's not something you would like to do, but you're forced to do. I feel like for anything that's forced, and, and this ties back into why God gives us free will, right? Like mm -hmm. God could have forced you to be a servant and God could have forced you to love him and obey him and all these things, yeah. but it wouldn't have made you successful. It, it also is more meaningless. If I told you that Bill Gates was forced to donate a hundred million dollars to the poor, would you have, I mean, would, would you have any more respect for Bill Gates as if I told you he didn't, he wasn't forced at all, but he decided he's going to donate 98% of his entire inheritance the day he dies mm. so it, it comes down to intention nobility and i think it also comes down to sustainability you're going into a major that you don't want to do and you're forced to do even if it's something noble might not be as feasible or likely as if you of your own volition decided i want to do this and even if you did accomplish it it might mean a little bit less than if it was of your own volition which ties into a whole bigger conversation on the purpose of free will and and yeah yeah part two part, part two, two um we'll save that for the 40th episode the 40th one um when do you have any thoughts anything to say no i mean thank you so much for hopping on the podcast Bishop. No, of course do you guys yeah. have any other questions i could tell you so many monkey stories there's a lot of monkeys monkey story? yeah there's sure, a lot give of monkeys us one. yeah one last one to wrap it up. One last one to wrap it up. Lighten up the, the mood. Well, so the first day that I got there, um, they were showing me around like the dorms that I was going to be staying in. And they showed me there's one coffee shop that was started by one of the Americans who had moved there from, from Texas. So it's like a little bit of home. And I, I was like, wow, uh, they're showing me all these places. And he's like, oh, make sure you lock your windows at night. But they never gave me the reason. And then... I was going to the coffee shop. They said it opened at 6.30. I was there at like seven. I opened the door, it's locked. And I said, what, that's weird. And I tried knocking, I see people inside. And so the girl comes out and opens the door and I said, well, I thought you guys were open at 6.30. Am I, am I in the wrong place or something? And she was like, no, no, no. We just have to keep the doors locked because, and then she waved to the trees and I was like, what? And I looked behind, there's a whole family of baboons <laughs> sitting in the trees outside. <laughs> And they were like, yeah, the, the baboons, they learned how to open doors <laughs> and they no like to way. come in and steal food. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, they're not afraid of you. They're like, no, they don't fear the women. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently they've learned the difference between men and women mm -hmm. and know that men will fight back. But women get scared. They're not going to try yeah. to fight a hundred pound baboon. So <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I would fight it, but uh, well, that, well the men, the men have gotten used yeah. to fighting back. And so the, the baboons are, are like, they know to fear men mm -hmm. more than they fear women there. Yeah. They wouldn't so, fear Munda though. So sometimes they'll lock the doors and they'll see like all the baboons gather outside and they'll have to call one of the men to come yeah. clear away all <laughs> the baboons. Away. Yeah. That's funny. And yeah, there, there's plenty of monkey stories. That's, that's a great one. We'll, we'll save the, we'll save all the other ones for another time, but yeah. uh, lock your windows at night. <laughs> the baboons have figured out. 
but uh, thank you, Vishal. Thank you for joining the episode. I know it was a roller coaster of a day to get you here, but uh, no, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate it. If you guys don't know, we're just in the Avalon, and we're yeah, hi, mom. View. I'm a big we're, fan. <laughs> we're like, this is like, anyways, that's a story for another time. But uh, thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed it, like, subscribe, comment. Um, Hit the notification bell. Hit the <laughs> notification bell. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's all. all. That's all. Thank you, guys. See you later. Thank you for having me. No way. No way. I forgot to click record. Oh, Shut up. Dude, I threw my phone in like